proving and um, committing to. Um, and that's the majority of what we're going to be dealing with tonight. You said uh, Dottie will be in at about quarter past, David? Yes. I think we should talk a little bit before that, um, just because sure. it's the most important thing tonight. Um, I'm going to read the top, the top part to everyone in case everyone hasn't read it. Um, recent race-related events coupled with similar events that have been occurring since our country's founding have implored us to take a thorough inventory of our district's commi commitment to addressing social justice issues, including those involving black, indigenous, and people of color. Although the COVID pandemic requires that we take measured steps to ensure everyone's safety, we view that social justice and anti-racist actions must also be taken with the same intensity and rigor. And then we have different points to it to adopt, which we'll go into in depth. Um, so the way I saw it was the first one, which I'll read, seems to be involved with what are we teaching in the um, in the district? What are we teaching children? Are we teaching them to uh, what sort of history are we teaching them? What sort of present are we teaching them? So I'll read this. In each school, evaluate curricula, books and materials staffing comp staffing complement hiring practices policies and procedures building atmosphere and community engagement regarding addressing social justice and anti-racist issues with students staff and community focus on ensuring that we are not only teaching our students inclusion but also actively teaching anti-racism using current world events and practices as examples ensure that our curricula books and materials accurately describe the formation of our country and why systemic racism continues today. So, does anyone have any idea of what it would look like to properly address this in the school? And does anyone have any idea of what we are currently, where we currently are as far as curriculum and education in general? What would it look like to people here for us to implement that properly? I think one th the um, one thing for sure was would be uh, we'd have to come up with an action plan. There'd have to be. Uh, I mean, each of these requires resources. It requires expertise and, and obviously staff time to um, to figure out how to go about doing it. So I, I would think the um, that would be the starting po the starting point. I'm not sure how specific we could be um, outside of that unless we had a whole. You know, a lot of staff members to, to help inform us. Yeah, speaking, mm -hmm. as a, um, speaking as a member of the diversity and equity committee, our district's committee, um, David, it, our intent was that this would serve as a template, if you will, for each school to have their own action plan that would address each of these eight items. Um, and that that would get into, I think, Tom, what you're asking, would get into the specific steps to take. And part of the logic behind that is that each school is in a different place in terms of these eight. Oh, come on. And I wonder if people could, if people could mute if they're not talking, it would be really helpful. Sorry, go on, Mike. So that's that's the end of my talk. Again, the key is that each school looks at its own environment, what's going on in its, in its own materials. Yeah. But that there has to be a specific plan at each school. Yeah. Otherwise, this is kind of a waste of time, I think, without that. Well, this could be an action item for each principal to do an right. internal audit of exactly what they're doing and report back to either this group or the board directly. Um, and I'm hoping very much that this it, there is a report back to the school board, that the school board has a way, and we're hoping these action plans by each school would give a way that the school board could ask, actually ask questions and understand what's really going on. And people in the chat, we will, we will address those topics in a moment. Yep. Um, who, who is um, elementary vice president was the first to raise their hand? 
Sorry, that's me. That's oh, Molly, but my sorry. other line is ringing right now, so I'll okay. come. I'll talk later. Um, well, I have Anne next. Sorry. Uh, um, Melly, like, if, no, sorry. Okay, do you want me to talk or not? Either yes, way. Please. Yes. Please. Okay. Um, this does need to be addressed on a district-wide level where we're using a curriculum district-wide in particular. I'm reminded of some teachers at Putney Central pointing out a particularly egregious example of racism in a reading book. And I don't know if that has ever been addressed. And I think we need to address it through all of our curriculum, not just leave it to the individual principals. I'm not familiar with it. Could you let us know? Uh, sure. It was an elementary reading curriculum. And I believe in an attempt to make curricula overlap, they had some reading regarding, uh, I believe, the Antebellum South. And it had a drawing of happy slaves. I, I, the teachers were really distressed about this, and I know it was passed along, but I don't know if the curriculum was removed or at least if stickers were slapped over that particularly egregious example. This would be the sort of thing that I think an internal school by school review could bring up and, okay. and but rectify. It is, but it is shared across the district and the SU, so. Okay. I think um, Anna's talking if, about Reading Street. I am. Which is a district wide um, curriculum <sighs> and teachers usually deal by deal with it on a case by case basis. So like they, I feel like what teachers do is that they don't, they'll not take out some books. They won't teach certain books or they'll replace the book with something else is how it, it's dealt with. There isn't a universal way to deal with it. Um, I tried to get it like a, um, like a spreadsheet so we could complain to the people who make it to keep track of these things, but they didn't go anywhere. So I think individual people would just don't teach what's egregious, but there's a lot of egregious stuff in that curriculum. Okay, well, this is this is something to deal with. Um, and if you're okay, we'll move on to Molly next. Absolutely. Okay, Molly. Hi, I just wanted to say, um, I teach at Dumberson. Dumberson doesn't use Reading Street, but we're the only school that doesn't. And I, I guess I had two things now, because I wanted to reply to Michaela, which I think which is that I think that um, it, there's a little, it's a little bit of a slippery slope leaving all the decisions up to different individual teachers, not because every individual teacher wouldn't have the best intentions, but um, not everybody is at the same place on a learning curve about these kinds of issues. And so I feel like something district wide is really important. And I, and which brings me to my next point, <laughs> which is that um, the social studies curriculum which is only one of the curricula we need to look at. I recognize that, but uh, that that has been in the works of being recreated at the state level. And I served on a committee for the K to eight, and um, there were only four of us who even showed up to work on the committee. And I felt like uh, there was very little attention to these kinds of issues as we were d working on it. I kept bringing things up, and and it wasn't. Um, it wasn't falling on deaf ears, but it wasn't like people were saying, oh yeah, this is a really important piece of our social studies curriculum. We need to look through this lens. Um, and so that process kind of stopped midway two years ago, maybe. And our district took on creating, recreating the social studies curriculum a bit. And it got partway. And then Julianne, who was guiding that, went into a principal role. And that's been kind of on the burnt back burner a little bit too. So just to know that curriculum wise our district is sort of in process of of um looking at social studies and it's a really good time to get things solidified in a way that at least on the pre i'm talking about k-8 you know that at least at that level you know there's a lot of room for uh putting in thoughts ideas and have to's <laughs> Well, a question just occurred to me. What sort of review do we do before getting the materials? We actually does have... Anyone know? Oh. No, I mean, you, you in particular, but does anybody know? Do we look into saying, does this publisher... Because I know there are some really bad ones uh, that 
were popping up in parts of the country calling you know uh, people who were enslaved uh, immigrants things like that and then we talk about this this uh, illustration um, I mean this seems like something we should look for ahead of time instead of you know throwing yeah up and when I was talking about curriculum work. I wasn't meaning things to be purchased I was meaning uh, standards outline of standards okay. so that's what was happening at the state level and the district level was an outline of um, the standards at each grade level and the units that would incorporate those standards. So it wasn't actual materials. It wasn't at the level of actual materials, but I don't know of a vetting kind of process with curricular materials. Okay. Do you, Michaela, is there any kind of vetting process that you know of? Or, or Ellen, I saw you here too, other teachers and Henry. At the high school level, there's no unified social studies curriculum other than maybe, um, I mean, we within our department will discuss curriculum and what we're teaching, but there's not a, we don't have outside, it's not like the elementary schools where we have outside kind of mandating, mandated curriculum. The teachers have quite a bit of um, leeway in what they teach, although I would say the diversity curriculum is fairly, fairly consistent across all the teachers, but as far as social studies goes, it, it is left more up to us to determine what to teach versus, we don't have prescribed textbooks or those types of things at the high school. I would say also like that there, uh, as far as I know that the curriculum directors, and I, my, my computer keeps freezing, sorry, um, have made those decisions uh, and it's kind of handed down. Um, Weeding Street is something that uh, I've been raising red flags about for a long time, and it wasn't at every school at that time. It has since been, is at almost every school. Um, so not that I think that individual people pick out these curricula because they like them, and then I think that that is, a, that is the scope of the investigation. Okay. Curricula will often get um, a pilot group, but I don't know that that those pilot groups always put the different curricula through the lens of diversity, et cetera, or any given lens, who knows what lens is. Um, if you're okay, Molly, we can go yeah, on yeah. to Ellen. Thanks. Thank you. Ellen? And you're muted, I think. Yeah, I just wanted to um, underscore the the issues around Weeding Street. Um, I'm not a classroom teacher, so I don't actively use it, but I was the teacher leader this past year at Putney. And a lot, I think every single teacher almost came to me talking about how, what, how problematic Weeding Street was for issues around racism, sexism, and classism. And that um, they could do what they could to leave certain things out, but that sort of just left things that were sort of harmless, but maybe not helpful. Um, so, and also uh, teachers talked about very, their whether they had the time to sort through it or they just had to use it as is, especially new teachers. And also like Molly said, you know, different people's learning curves. Some people might not realize things are offensive and use them, but it seemed like it was pretty unanimous at Putney that people were really, uh, concerned about the messages in, um, in reading speed. Yeah. Okay. Well, if we're having issues with them, we are purchasing them. We are, we are patronizing the publisher. So we should get to the bottom of it. If it's not something we, it's not something we find appropriate, we should get rid of it. Um, but let's review that's on here. Um, uh, David, if you're okay, Ellen, is that okay? Yeah. Going to David, David. Mm -hmm. You're muted. This is uh, from a, a previous question, I think talking about um, how, to, how to do all this and, and, and how differently teachers do it. A couple of the things of the points in the, um, in the proposal, in the commitment are to create space and provide the resources necessary for teachers to do the internal work of becoming critically conscious, reflectively, reflective anti-racist practitioners and um, holding regular anti-racist study groups for teachers, incorporating readings and discussions at faculty meetings. And then there's another one, uh, another point 
a more structural one is to ensure that each school has a student focused organization where uh, black indigenous and people of uh, other people of color students can provide each other with support and collectively define issues needing additional attention and uh, so a student or a student organization and also a diversity and equity committee in the school building which includes responsibility for leading regular discussions about white supremacy and staff meetings and then the third is to have every school have a diversity and equity teacher leader identified so there are some structural things in here to recognize to um to support the, the 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 growth and development and and changes and process that's involved in being able to to reach the you know the broader goal of having a, a having a, a social justice and anti-racist uh, approach to to learning and in, included in the curricula it's not just about checking the books and and um, and hiring practices and policies those are obviously important as well and that's why i kind of come back to the the, the first point which is that um, we're going to need action action plans from all the schools because they're all they're so different that that no one approach you know the high school is obviously very different um, than the, the the elementary schools but each of the elementary schools is is really unique and uh, really different culture and different community so it, they're going to have to be uh, individual plans but they will they'll need to be able to address all of the goals if if we wind up if we adopt this thanks. I just want to make a point. Um, some people are making very good points in the chats. If you don't mind, because that's not going to get into the minutes and all of us won't be able to spend a lot of time on reading it. If you don't mind raising your hand and, and if you can, if you're okay with it, speaking uh, you know, to the group, it might people might be able to get it better because people are making some good points. Uh, Thomas, one more thing about the chats, uh, just a structural thing. The uh, meeting's being recorded, and obviously we have minutes. It's a it's a public school district meeting, but the chat does not show up in the public record. So exactly. anything that's anything that's happening there is not necessarily going to be recorded. Uh, so if you really if you want to be participate, you have to come to the come to the floor. Yeah. Okay. Next, if you're okay, David. Next up is Tim. Um. Yeah, I was thinking of uh, Bill Holiday, how he. Uh, kind of shunned uh, textbooks and created his own uh, materials to teach his courses. And I was thinking, uh, rather than uh, investigate the materials taught, uh, one approach would be to look at the outcomes that we expect, the changes in in knowledge, skills, attitudes um, at the at each grade le grade level, and and begin with that. What do we want students to? Be leaving each grade level um, knowing and being aware of regarding anti-racism. Very good question. And leaving it to the teachers to use films, YouTubes, written materials, current um, newspaper articles, whatever materials they feel is best to reach those goals. Okay. Um, if you're okay, Tim, we'll go on to Jack. Hi, everybody. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, state for the record what I typed into the chat. Thank you for letting me know about that particular um, item of how things are recorded or not recorded in the minutes. Um, I advised the middle school leadership teams um, and in some of them very direct and some more indirectly. And they are working on culture shift uh, at, the, at, at its core is what they're looking at is the school climate surveys, particular data points that have risen at all the schools that I've worked directly with are issues around inclusion and, and issues around kindness. And it, it pops up in different ways. Um, they do school-wide programming to really try to get at something to lift up the issues. They could be going deeper into all of these. It would be wonderful to have even more partnership, I think, with, with different uh, folks from the schools, whether it's more staff, more families, um, more students, uh, certainly more students of color on the leadership teams themselves. But it's, it's a group and uh, a way of getting a culture shift that is, is already in place and could simply be bolstered with what their efforts are. 
point. Very good. Thank you. Um, so uh, just to let everyone know, if you don't have your full name uh, listed in here, if you could uh, either change that or let us know, we need it for the minutes. And the next person I'm going to call, I don't know your full name, but Abes, uh, Rev Abes, mm -hmm. feel free to speak. I'm not sure your full name. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. So I am curious if, well, I was kind of answered in the chat that between eight to 10 years ago was the last time that there was a motion to address the mascot team and logo of the school, which has been a, a racist symbol of the colonels slash colonel. And so I was wondering if, if there would be um, an updated motion to change that to anything else. If you don't mind telling me, I'm not aware of the, uh, the significance. Well, the colonel was a Southern Confederate military leader and previously the, slo the slogan was pride of the South. And so I just think a <coughs> militarized uh, image would be more appropriate. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't aware. Um, yeah, I, I, if that is, if that is the, the connotation, that is an issue. <laughs> I didn't know that. I, when I went to high school, it was a, a, a Native American name for ours, which is obvious. Um, that, I, that, and, I, and I've been looking out in the area, oh, which, which towns name their, their teams after Native Americans or something, but wasn't aware of that. That's something well, to look into. If we went into the direction of meaning reclaiming the indigenous names for the area. Brattleboro was previously Wontestock, which is of the Sokoki tribe, which means the confluence of the Long and West, no, the Long and Lost Rivers. And so I think that we would have to get their permission and ask for their guidance if we were to name something under, in their honor. And so uh, my other concern was if there has been any organized motion about voting no on Article 4 about postponing passing the budget so that we could prioritize enslavement reparations and prison abolition and labor union empowerment. I didn't get to read that over. I'm sorry. Um, let's see. Could you describe it a bit more to us? Well, as far as I understand, the deadline for the ballot is the 30th, and there is a $50 million budget, which the public can vote on to say no to passing the budget. We don't have the right to vote on the municipal budget, which is only about $18 million. But if we try to boycott this budget so that we can focus on legislation to have uh, reparations and public and prison abolition and labor union empowerment focused on, I wonder if that would be productive and effective. Well, possibly politically, there'll be there'll be staffing problems because of it, though. It'll have uh, that that'll be the outcome. You know, if, if we don't pass the budget, the school district, even if it's for political uh, political protest, the, the school will have a school district will have issues. Um, I'm not familiar with it, but as far as we're concerned in this in this uh, in this committee, I don't think uh, there would be anything useful for this committee for towards that. And if it's if it's to protest. So you're saying that this would have a, an effect on the uh, town of Brattleboro reacting with their municipal budget? Well, we in Brattleboro aren't allowed to vote on the municipal budget. It's, the public isn't, only the representatives are. And so the public can vote on the school budget, which is about four times more. Right. Does anyone have any ideas? Any thoughts? 
If there is none at this time, my last question is if there has been any motion to advise the Brattleboro Municipal Government to open a reparations office rather than depend on the patriotic patriotic volunteerism of the middle school students who have been addressing the missing soldiers of colors on the Civil War Memorial that has been vandalized multiple times to create awareness about how history has been erasing the soldiers of color and poor white people that were enlisted and um, never paid their bounty, which is now um, uh, over worth over three hundred thousand dollars to be given to the individual families um, that are the survivors of the descendants. I mean, it's my understanding that that would be something completely to take up with Brattleboro uh, at a Brattleboro town meeting. That's my understanding of the best option there. As an educational team working with the students, isn't there a responsibility from the diversity committee to participate in that? Possibly. This is new to me. This is a new, uh, I, I didn't know about any of this, but this is uh, possibly for the future. I can't comment on it quite yet. Well, I will put in my email address because I would like to continue this conversation and thank you for your time. Please do, and, pl and this is a monthly meeting and please continue to come. Okay, uh, next we have Rhonda. Thank you. Um, one of the things that crossed my mind as I was listening to a lot of this, I've been at the high school now for 12 years and um, served uh, with a public agency be well, before that and then many, many years in California. And one of the things that we did in California that I would encourage this board to look at adopting is when we have issues like a curricular overhaul, when we have issues of changing school culture and infusing, um, so far what I've seen in this district is that it's often um, laid at the feet of some very strong people who are willing to do extra work over and above what they're already tasked to do in their day-to-day -day worlds as teachers. And as we all know, that doesn't stop at five or four when the bell rings. Um, and so what, what we found very, very, very helpful was to actually commit to dedicated time off for a group of people. They would call, they actually, there was one called a curriculum committee and the, the school and the district so believed in something that they would allow a group of people and they would have a representative from each school, from each subject, a diversity person anyone that came to the table that had stake in what we were trying to do and allowed them to work on that solidly for either a month, two months, three months. Um, and then they would come back once every week to two and meet with teams at school to say, this is what we've found. Um, please give me some feedback on how I should move forward. And I really would encourage us to adopt that because we've been looking at issues now for a very long time um, but we, we segregate ourselves from each other, school to school, sometimes grade to grade. And so that's just my pitch. This is something that I think we should so invest in that we really give some people some dedicated time to get it done. Very understandable. Yep. Because this is extra work. This is more responsibilities and yes, mm -hmm. understood. Thank you. And just to let everyone know, this one topic, the you know basically the, the different curricula and education, this is only one of eight points. I'll give you quickly the other seven, so you know if I have a you know you have a question about something, it is coming up later. Um, the next one will be providing social justice awareness and anti-racist training to all staff on at least an annual basis. Um, the third one, as David mentioned, is creating a space uh, and pro create space and provide the resources ne necessary for teachers to do the internal work. So basically, internal um, uh, education for the teachers uh, to work on their own their own mindset. Uh, part four, uh, part part four, possibly the most important uh, staffing and keeping uh, the, the to tr to make the uh, workforce more diverse than it is now. And this, I think, is a uh, an emergency. Uh, five, um, ah, 
outside purchasing and who we do business with as a district to uh, where available only do business with outside organizations and individuals that have demonstrated commitment to social justice and anti-racism, including from, uh, from businesses that are owned by people of color. Uh, six, uh, thoroughly evaluate the successes and failures of remote education and how this might affect marginalized people, marginalized students. Um, seven, ensuring the school has um, a student, one, a student-focused organization um, where uh, black, indigenous, people of color students can provide each, each other with support. So basically, um, mutual support for, for the students of color, um, if, I, if I read that right. And, and the finally uh, eight will be holding ourselves accountable to at least an annual, basically an annual audit or a review of what we've done where we are. So those are all the points. So if you have a, a question for later, maybe if you want to bring it up, then. Hold on, someone's coming in. All right, um, Sean. Yeah, I, I, I uh, read this over very carefully um, and had a discussion also earlier in the day with uh, Mike Slostak. So I was just wondering a couple of things. I, I think it has a real good foundation, but what I would like to do is you choose anyone you want? Yeah. make it inclusive to... If everyone doesn't mind, everyone but Sean possibly me mute, if you don't mind. Go on, Sean. Um, just kind of lost my train there for a minute. Um, what, I, what I would like to do is... You said it was a good foundation. Yeah, choose a good foundation, but make it as simple as possible. Um, these are a lot of very, very difficult items. Um, so in light of that, I would actually query both Mike and Michaela at this time um, to give an overall view of what they were trying to achieve in a big picture. I mean, I think I know, but it might be good uh, since they were sort of the genesis of this document, it'd be good to know, um, you know, things that they specifically felt uh, very important for being included in the document and, and how, how we would actually implement all of these things. Some of them are difficult. Um, many, many of them are difficult. So um, it's, it's sort of an action plan, like David said. I think that would be really good to have an action plan. And so anyway, if I could, Mr. Chairman, if I could question either Michaela or Mike. Please do. Well, I'll give a shot at it. Um, first of all, I think if it, how many on this, how many people have l looked at um, Nicole's video that's part of this document? If you have, that kind of says it from a student point of view, I guess the whole thing we're trying to say here and why we're trying to do things differently. I think she articulated better than I ever could why this is needed to be done. Um, I, I couldn't state it any better. Um, in terms of answering, Sean, what specific actions, I mean, I can come up with things in my own ideas about how to do this, but that's where we're saying each school needs to sit down and actually do it and look at its own environment. And it is gonna be varied by, from school to school. Uh, for example, I would say at the high school, which is where I'm based, we have almost nobody, hardly any people uh, of color um, on our staff. I mean, that's a major issue. We need to change that. We have all openings every day, almost every day I see openings coming up throughout our district and including the high school, I we need to be acting on that in a way where we're actually really aggressively going after candidates, looking for candidates. If we don't get candidates of color, then we need to go after them in a very assertive way. Uh, those are the kinds of things we need, but it varies by school. So the actions, I, I mean, again, to answer your question, Sean, I can come up with Mike Sostak thinks we should do but it really has to be thought through at a school level, in my opinion. 
Well, possibly what our job here is to, if we adopt this as a board, is to send uh, tasks out to the different schools, to the different principals, and uh, even the, the different teachers to come back with us with their ideas and their progress. Um, it sounds like if we adopt this, um, the next step is to go to the different schools and tell us what they think on an individual level, on an individual level, and relatively quickly. Um, I. I'm sorry, I can't raise my hand. My screen is frozen again. That's okay. You, you don't have to. Sean was talking to you or Michael. Um, I would say that um, on the surface, these things seem complicated, but they're not really complicated. And really, all it takes is a commitment. And, um, and that commitment is not just to action. It's also a commitment to shifting your own thinking. Um, this is really a, a safety issue. This is about the safety of our students. This is not Ivar. It's connected to everything we do. And this is just really outlining actionable steps that we can do to strengthen institutionalizing, um, being as equitable as we can. We're working really hard um, to do that, to build infrastructure from the inside out. Um, uh, and um, and we need support in doing that. I have never, I haven't heard anyone say, um, anyone in a position to hire people say, I want to hire people of color. I haven't heard anyone say that. Um, there haven't any been any explicit um, expressions of our dedication to justice in our schools. There have been movements in that direction, um, but from the inside out, I think that this is really important and I don't think that it's complicated actually. I think that it's the opposite. This is really simple. Um, we do a lot of complicated things when dealing with kids and um, really teachers are doing amazing work, including kids who are, have come from trauma, who have a lot of different things going on. So this, work is just supporting that it's not anything else this is not asking someone to do one more thing this is creating an infrastructure for equity for all kids that's what it is and i i mean i don't know um to be honest what's complicated about it to me it seems really simple i think possibly what sean meant is the uh the implementation of this but i think the ideas are like you said are straightforward I think the actual, uh, possibly the implementation of some things might be difficult, but we're still going to do them. Uh, reason, one of the reasons we have that third bullet about creating space, and this kind of touches on some of the things Rhonda was saying too, about giving teachers the opportunity and p other people the opportunity to really work on this stuff. If you don't have the time or you're, or if you're not given the time and it's not time that is viewed in a positive way, then it doesn't get done. So part of it is, is, a, is a view by you folks on the school board and then all the way down the chain of command that this is really important to do. But as Michaela's saying, none of this is rocket science in terms of figuring out what to do. It is somewhat difficult to to implement, but again, it's commitment. One other thing I wanted to add to what, what Michaela said, and she mentioned safety of students, but I wanna emphasize it's not just safety and, and potential harm to kids of color, but it's to our, our kid not of color. Um, they're not being, they're not seeing people in role models, and by that I mean administrators, teachers, counselors, they're not seeing people in, only the only people they see in those roles are white people, primarily in our schools. And that's not, that's harmful to everybody, not just the kids of color. And I, I think that's often missed. Yeah, personally, the way I look at it is sometimes this is thought of when you, when you talk about the diversity of staffing as a, a, an issue of fairness to teachers, to possible teachers, but that's true. But to me, the biggest 
uh, group that this is unfair to his children to see a slanted version of society or a, a society that's tilted one way that's not going to prepare them for if they are outside of Vermont or in the rest of the world. It's not, it's, it's, it's not giving the children a, a full education um, because their education is more than learning math or learning how to read. It's also how to think. So. Last week at the high school, we had a professional development session where faculty attended and we used um, Nicole's video um, as a way to kind of kick off the conversation. And I have never, I've been at the high school for 14 years and I've never seen such a candid open conversation about what needs to be done as I did at, during that meeting, that hour meeting. And uh, I can just say that the grassroots is there. The teachers, most of the teachers want to make changes and they're willing to work to do it. Um, but they've got to be given, they, first of all, it's got to be condoned as good work. It's got to be viewed as good work. And secondly, it, they've got to be given some time to do it in. Yep. Um, just in the interest of time, we have a lot of other questions. Is it okay with other people if we move on to a couple points so we can address more things? Is that okay with anyone? Or does anyone say, no, I, want, I really want to talk about this? I did have a comment. Okay, Henry, you're next. Because I'm not sure, Thomas, where you're going next. So I guess I don't know if my comment applies to where you're going or what. Has been said. The, the, the next point was this this point uh, provides social justice awareness and anti racist training to all staff on at least an annual basis. That was the next point out of eight. Okay, I thought you already read through all the points to this. To I, I was, we're, we're going to go by each one to talk about okay, how do we work on this part? How do we work on this part? I just wanted to let you all know what the parts are so you could say, I want to okay. talk about that one later. I might preserve my comments and I didn't realize we're still going through it point by point. So I think I'll hold until we get to the point that I want. To that was, about. that was basically in, in assessing um, the educate what's being educated uh, or sorry, what's being taught to the kids, what the education is currently. That was point one. Point two is on providing social justice awareness and anti-racist training to all staff on at least an annual basis. Does anyone have any ideas? That seems pretty straight, the most straightforward point to me. Uh, I think absolutely. Um, what do you think? Anybody? Uh, next person is Jillian, if you have anything to point, anything to add. Hi, yes, I do. I actually also had some questions uh, potentially before moving forward with sure. my comments. Sure. Um, sure. I'm not exactly sure when you're considering having this proposal implemented. I know that I like, I know you want it in place for the next year, but how much time are you planning to give each uh, school time to prepare? Because you were talking about potentially having each school think through these and bring back their proposals on how they thought they could best implement that. So I'm wondering if you have an exact deadline in place or if you're really taking the time to work through all of this. Um, I know that you're having regular meetings on this. So I wasn't sure what that this is. This is new. This just came up last meeting. So last Wednesday, we're just going, we're discussing it now. We're just getting into it now. Okay. All right. So whatever um, we discuss. All right. So I, I'm just going to say a couple things. Um, I'm a person of color. I went through the Vermont education system from elementary school to high school. And I do appreciate that this proposal is on the table right now. I definitely think a lot of these things are needs, uh, are needs that have to be met that haven't been met for a long time. Um, I'm actually a little concerned about how broad and basic all of this is at the moment. I think these are good goals, but I do think that you're gonna need to sort out each of these different categories a little bit more before actually bringing it to the schools. That's that's my thought. I don't know if they'll agree. Um, but I think when it's too open, I know that sometimes people can take it up to their own interpretation and then actually cause harm when they believe that they're doing good. So that's one thing. Uh, for the racial training, for the racial justice training and the all of that, I'm not sure where you're looking at potentially having um, educators get that from or various get that from. Uh, this is just a suggestion, but I do know that in Vermont, there are different racial justice um, organizing groups that have um, a lot of information and knowledge around these subjects. And I think they would be very good resources to tap into um, who can come in and provide 
more, I think potentially more in-depth information that would be helpful for each school district. I know that of one in particular um, where members of this organization also have students or have children who were students in, in this district. Um, so they are able to speak with firsthand experience um, or their children can as well. So that's something because I have personally attended racial justice training before that was led by people who very clearly did not know what they were talking about. And I have left spaces feeling more harmed than helped. And I also, on a personal level, I felt that, but then I was really concerned about the type of education that non POC people were getting from these trainings. And especially if we're looking at our education system, we need to make sure that those who are doing these trainings are actually um, as educated and helpful as possible. So that's a suggestion. I know that there's different organizations in this area that you could potentially connect with, and I'd be willing to name some at a later point as well. If you, if you don't mind either, if you don't want to name it right now, if you could email us afterwards, um, absolutely. Any recommendations you have, it would, it would be great. Will do. Okay. And let me know at the end of the meeting if you need any e email addresses, or I'll just, yeah, I'll, it'll be in the minutes, or you just let us know if you need our addresses. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you can add them to the chat as well. I can do mine if I can remember it. All right. Thank you. Sure. Sorry. Let me just write mine while I'm at it. Oh, Thomas, I'll put mine in as the chair. It would make sense to, for it to come to me, and then you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Perfect. Even better. All right. Um, well, Jillian, if you're okay, the next person up is Tim. Was Michaela kicked out? Is she in the waiting room? She's back. Okay. Sorry, I can't see it all the time. Okay, a couple of points. Um, first, I like all eight points. I don't think they're overly complicated, but I really agree that the, the, the difficulty is going to be implementing them. So Vermont has 1.4% of its population is black. One of the arguments about uh, the difficulty of hiring people of color from teaching, teaching colleges is that people of color do better with uh, teachers who are of color. And it's, the argument is that um, wouldn't, isn't it better for people of color to teach in populations where they can reach more people of color? An argument against them teaching in schools that are 99% white, for example. Um, so th that's a dilemma for, uh, for Vermont, because as everybody has rightly pointed out, our students need um, diversity in, the, uh, um, in our faculty ranks and the staffing ranks. There is uh, good studies that show that um, schools that have vice principals and principals of color do a whole lot better in hiring people of color. Um, a resource, it's not dated, but decades ago, Donna Shalala at the University of Wisconsin came up with the Madison Plan. Uh, one of the innovative uh, recommendations that they had was when a department hired one black person, well, get a free one, hire two. Um, so you have people of color not coming um, to a lonely experience, but they have uh, a partner. That, that of course, kind of doubles your uh, your resources. But the the plan has a lot of good ideas. I'm going to review it and pass pass those on. But um, getting back to the uh, eight points, I I think that they're not overly complicated. They'll be discussed for a long time, and I'm hoping that the uh, uh, the board will approve this. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Ellen? I wanted to um, mention um, that if there's an issue with not only hiring people of color to teach in schools, but also retaining teachers of color and also retaining students of color. Uh, for example, my daughter won't be attending Rattleboro, she'll be going to a different school because of her experience with uh, with all of this um, these issues at BAMS. Um, but I also wanted to talk about um, just make sure that it's addressed. Not only it's not only important to teach about 
racism and train teachers about racism, but also to be thinking about whose stories are they telling in their curriculum and whose faces are the kids seeing, um, whose accomplishments are being celebrated um, and making sure that that's um, the variety and diversity of, of uh, you know, artists and authors and scientists and mathematicians are, is, that needs to be included, I feel, in the document as well. Okay. That's all I um, we have uh, Michael. Um, I wanted to comment on what Tim said um, and emphasize that environment is critical in our schools. It, it doesn't do any good, and we've learned that, to hire somebody into our school system if they're dissatisfied and they leave. So, and that has been a problem of ours. We don't have a great reputation out there as a school system, overall no, as a you don't. school system based on what's happened um, to people of color in our school system. So our reputation is not good and we have to change that. Uh, another point that Tim talked about, yes, the overall uh, minority population in Vermont is 1.4% or whatever, but in Brattleboro, it's considerably different. The last numbers I saw is our school system is around 13% of people uh, considered in a minority category in terms of students. I don't know if that's the valid number today, but it's it's a lot higher than the overall uh, average for uh, Vermont. And I think that's important uh, when we're recruiting people. And also a, a good way to increase uh, the, the diversity of the population in the area is to uh, increase uh, decent paying jobs being uh, available to people. Now, a main reason why people don't move somewhere is because they don't have a job. If you have a job lined up, well, you have a good reason to move somewhere and bring your family. So uh, it has an effect that you know could expand into the rest of the population. Uh, Tara? Hi, I'm Tara O'Brien, um, um, and um, I'm a representative of the Root, um, Social Justice Center, uh -huh. and I just want to say one thing in regards um, to that um, position right here. I would like to see the board accept this wholeheartedly um, as a vote of confidence and trust in the work that Michaela and the Diversity and Equity team, um, Committee has put into this. I think um, they know this subject more than anyone on this board. And I think that um, by voting to support it, you would you would show that you have confidence in the POC that you've hired to do this job. Um, I'm also here as a parent who um, I identify as a POC also. Uh, my daughter is a POC and she went through the school system for high school. When she went through the school system, I was also concerned about um, not having adult um, at school model and about quality of education when it came to um, the diversity training, I was very upset, very um, dissatisfied, dissatisfied, dissatisfied with, with that experience. And my daughter hated it at this school. She hated it um, she, um, for a very variety of reasons. Thank goodness she didn't have be, um, behavioral problems that put her on um, standing in school at Jeopardy. However, I am um, actively involved in the BIPOC community at the root, and to hear parents not have trust in school is really, really upsetting. That it's uh, uh, the, the reputation, as you know, was said by Mike, um, it's not good amongst parents. I've heard people talk about students here. I've heard people talk about um, teachers here. I haven't, um, heard about what adopting this this document will be for the parents of the community to know if I had this as a parent with my child going to the high school knowing that you've committed to this I could hold you accountable to this so it's not only a, a document of um, commitment it's a document of accountability um, that I think that would be uh, healthy for the healthy for peer-to-peer conversations how everyone is unpacking you know, internalized white supremacy we're always we're always doing that you know we're raised in this culture I'm a POC I have an internalized 
um, because I just, but by the sheer fact that I grew up in this country. So anything that supports us peer to peer as adults for these children in our community to commit to, you know, social justice and anti-racism, I highly, highly, highly want to um, recommend that you show, show confidence in the, person, the people that you've asked to do this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Rhonda, did you still want to talk or do we? Um, yes, I, what I was going to say is one of the things I think we could do, um, my colleague who I admire very much, Michelle Hood, brought this up in one of the meetings that Mike was speaking about earlier. Um, I am nearing retirement and I think it would be absolutely wonderful if we looked at people who were willing to do a job exchange and I would be very willing to be part of that where I could um, exchange my position with a, pos with a person of color in another school and actually do like a job swap like that. And I think if we can really c get that culture going, especially amongst people who are closer to retiring, to bring a younger person of color into our school and have them be known, because I notice how m many times we hire our student teachers. So if, you know, a lot of people are saying it's hard to get, um, a more diverse population of people of color because the local colleges from which we recruit, um, either there are cross state agreements like with UMass and that sort of thing. But I think if we really commit to a position exchange and you know, me, me being at the top of a pay scale, willing to swap with someone who's um, within the first two, three, four, five years of their career and doing that in a committed response where we are bringing in a, a significant group of people of color and possibly saving the district money at the same time and certainly not costing any more, but really committing to programs like that. And that's what I meant about giving the time and thinking about that. But I would be very willing to look at doing something like that. Because I think we've, we've got to make that commitment to find ways to, to get people of color on our campus teaching and it can't be just straight uh, in the box thinking about um, student programs student teacher programs which i think we still need to do but become innovative in ways like that as well and, and like i said i'm very willing to be working on anything that makes that sort of commitment now can you clarify do you mean so if you, you say you are near retirement say yes. you had say you had i don't know five years three years left before mm -hmm. retirement, would you say that as you retired, we would replace you or before you were retired, you would go and work somewhere else? What I'm saying, what the, um, what the program entails, the way I, it has been explained to me, Thomas, is I, I don't have, to, anybody doesn't have to be close to retirement, but I think the opportunity for future employment would be closer. So if I were getting ready to retire, and I said, I'm going to do a job swap for one year. So for this year, my second to last year or my final year, probably my second to last year, because you always want to be there for your final year, I think. Um, so my second to last year or my third to last year, I'm just going to trade my job and I'm going to go work at a different school and a person of color can come and have my job for a year. And then as I retire, that person is already known to the school, knows the school, knows the communities, embedded with the kids. And I would hope we would commit to hiring that person as strongly as we do our student teachers. So that's what I'm saying. I think that's a way to get people of color on our campus with that person making a one year commitment that at the end of the year, if they want to return to their school, it's there. If, if I'm exiting my job, then you know that person well, know what they can do in their position as they held it for me for a year. So I think that's one, that's an additional level that I can just commit to. That's a great idea. Um, that, that reminds me a little bit of, a, of an idea that my wife had that I wanted to bring up here, which was something like teachers in, red, in residency, where we take for a year or a semester even, uh, we allot uh, a position or two positions or whatever. Um, and we budget for it 
where we have this to be somebody from outside of the district to a person of color to see what it's like to work here we can see how they work it can if even at the worst it's only for that year hopefully it's longer hopefully it's um, getting somebody interested in staying here um, I think like you say thinking outside the box is necessary because you know uh, going on with we hope and we strive to isn't hasn't worked yet so we have to do something different right so, yes that's a that's a great idea to think about I've never thought of it uh, it's a great idea credit goes to Michelle Hood to, sorry oh credit uh, goes to right Michelle now. Hood <laughs> Well, we're, we're, we're kind of talking about multiple topics. I think that's okay. Those three, those three points, three, uh, two, three, and four, uh, we're just blending together. It's okay. Uh, if you're okay, I'd like to go on to uh, Tara again. Sorry, I didn't lower my hand. I'm good. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, Robin? Hi. Um... Yes, here, I'll turn my video on. Um, I just wanted to say, I feel like um, the sense that I got from the discussion here and from the meeting last Wednesday is that the board is interested in implementing this proposal. Um, but I know that a lot of times when you're on a board, when you go about adopting a new plan, the, the sort of tenor of the discussion is, to figure out what might be wrong with it so that we can make sure we're doing our due diligence that we didn't adopt something wrong. I think that is a really unhelpful framework in this case and that since the board knows that they need help achieving all this and here is a proposal that lays it all out for you, I think that it would be really good to shift the discussion to the, the framework of how can we support and implement the things in this proposal. And if people have ideas like Rhonda was just saying about specific oh, actions then that's great but i it seems almost like it's people are, are devil's advocate or putting a debate when you talk about you know oh there's only one percent in the state of vermont first of all that doesn't even apply to most of our schools and secondly the unspoken part of that thought is so it's not really as big a problem for us but if you watch the video that nicole showed that's just one person who happened to win an award for her eloquent writing. But I guarantee you there are many other children in this district who have been harmed. And the urgency of this problem and the necessity of addressing it with specific actions says to me that we need to stop debating whether or not we're gonna do this and figure out how can we do this really well. Very good. I agree. Um... It is our job, I, unfortunately. We do have to go through it just to, I support it very much. We have to, we have to discuss it. Um, but I agree, personally, this is something we should support and implement as soon as possible. Uh, but also in the discussion, we, we find out uh, you know, more ideas on how we implement it, uh, ways to improve it. So, um, Morris, oh, sorry, Dari, Dottie Morris, sorry. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention, David said you're only here till 5.45, so I'd like you to discuss. Oh, okay. Um, again, I want to uh, express what a lot of people said. I would really endorse uh, this particular um, kind of plan. Um, I think, uh, you know, once you accept it, because it sounds like you're headed that way, um, it would be good to take each part of what is requested and um, come up with some really good uh, and clear strategic uh, kind of points uh, as well as actions. So not just the actions, but it has to be really strategic. And so thinking of ways that you can approach each one of those uh, uh, points with some really good specific strategies. Uh, and then you know, what resources, because I think just handing it over to the school administrators and said, figure it out, uh, as someone said, I think that's kind of scary and damaging, especially if people don't have the skills to really look it through. And then it becomes just an exercise of, I'm gonna get it to get it done. So I would say that you would want to invest some resources to prepare 
the school administrators are those people who are planning to stand all of this together um, to do that. Um, it doesn't matter if you have a low percentage of uh, people of color living uh, in and around Brattleboro, but what is very important, and I noticed this other places in New England as well, um, the number of kids of color, uh, if, you, if you look at 18 and below in a lot of the states in, in New England, you have a larger number or percentage or proportion of kids of color uh, than you have people over uh, 25 and above. And so that presents, it's in itself, it presents a very interesting concern because now you're planning for a school that you've never had before um, in the past. So you have to start thinking more forward thinking about uh, what will it mean um, to have that proportion. Um, and then I think that I really like the, the, the process around providing training and, and having it as ongoing for faculty uh, or, or staff. And I would include everybody and not just the teachers, but anyone who comes in contact with the children, including bus drivers. And because the, that's where a lot of things happen, like on the bus and playground monitors and, and everyone. So they will know how to have an impact. So I would like to suggest that it, the training gets expanded to beyond just teachers, uh, but also anyone who's in the building and having contact with children. Yeah. Um, because point. that can make or break the experience of children, um, especially if other children observe that behavior and nothing happens, it, it just yeah. creates more of a trauma for them. Um, I had one more point. Oh, I can't remember what the last no one rush. Whatever but, you have. But I would like to really in, endorse it, and but just make sure that there are some strategic points beneath each one to, in order to achieve the goal and then have something to like an overall view of, of where all of this will lead lead you. Cause it, you know, these, each one of these points are part of a bigger picture and it's leading you somewhere. So um, when you articulate to administrators or to parents even where you're going, it'll be good to have an, an idea of your trajectory and, and where you want to lead. Um, and as someone else said that, uh, we know that children learn better in a more diverse environment, uh, you know, and so I think that it's for all children. So if we could make, if, if the point could be made that this is not just for kids of color, it's for all of the students, that it creates academic excellence for all students, not just for students of color. And, um, all of the problems that we're having in other areas, uh, so you know, when we think about police forces and we think about educate in, um, in medical to feel all of these, it all stems from their K through 12 schooling. And so if we could start working with kids uh, in a way to let them know uh, about accurate history as opposed to inaccurate history, it could really help uh, when they go into their profession. Well, that's actually, I think, the point that um, was that we were talking before you got in here. Uh, point one was mainly based, uh, mainly looking into what we are teaching kids about history, about not just history, but uh, society and uh, what we are teaching currently and what what we're lacking. Um, but it, to your point about uh, coming up with specific uh, specific goals and specific standards, um, I think that's the the most important thing from all this is uh, not just committing to, to, to this, but to having, uh, we, we, ex we uh, expect to meet this by this date. We expect to show this instead of saying, you know, this is a good idea to strive for. We have to say, this is when it's due. Um, that's what I think that we need to focus on. And, 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 and strategies for each one. Yes. And, and like we were talking earlier, um, a lot of the strategies need to be catered to the different schools because we have elementary schools up to high school and um, different administrations and different teachers. So, yeah. Um, well, if you're okay, we have a few people have, that have questions. Henry? Yeah, I just want, I wanted to comment. Um, the I'm here on behalf of the, the Faculty Advisory Council, um, also because I support two reasons. One, because I support the work of Mike and Michaela have done, but I also am here on behalf of uh, representatives. There's three of us here today, actually, Mike, Rhonda, 
and I from the council from the high school. And I mean, I guess the way I think of it, it does work at two levels. It works at the level, the macro level with you guys, hopefully giving this your assent. And, and so it, it gives it kind of um, broader credence in terms of you guys putting your impetus behind it. And then at the more local level, school by school, it enables us to do work that we really want to do. For example, the, the council met with um, uh, teachers on Friday and there was, there was quite a bit of um, push among the, among the teachers when we met them to get more diversity in, the, in our staff at the high school. And so we're already beginning the process of, of how can we as the council support that effort. And um, we've already got you know, some plans brewing that we want to do, including a round table of um, current and former teachers of color in, in the district. And so, you know, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a two way street. On the one hand, you guys setting the framework and then like, maybe like Dottie was saying, have a, having some of those things laid out. And, and so we're already moving forward a little bit in that direction. And, and it would be great to get the support of the, the, the board um, to make it really concrete in terms of what each school is doing. So, so I'd say. Mm -hmm. I think that, that, I think it falls kind of what you were saying with the teachers, uh, leading within their own schools i think it, that comes into uh numbers number seven which we'll come to which is ensure that each school has a student focused organization where bipoc students can provide uh each other with support and then it also goes on uh, a diversity and equity and sorry at a d diversity and equity committee which includes responsibility for leading regular discussions about white supremacy at staff meetings and three uh, diversity and uh, equity teacher leaders identified so that sounds, uh, if I if I heard you right, um, similar. Well, to kind of. I mean, there is already we are already doing the study groups at the school, um, so we are doing that, which I'm a part of, and that happens uh, monthly at the school, which is great. Um, this is more the faculty advisory council is part of the union contract with the with the district, and so each building can have one. Um, and right now, currently, the high school is only the only building that has a faculty advisory council, but it is along the lines of what you're talking about, Thomas, in the sense of that. The, we as teachers are a representative body of, of the staff and we're trying to push some things that we feel the staff you know, wants us to push for and, and feels you know they're important that maybe aren't getting addressed and and the staff can help push in that direction so it is related but a little slightly different in the sense that the the councils are outlined in the agreement that we have with the district okay. uh, i just want to raise some of the other points while we're while we're discussing uh, i know we have a few more people who have questions um but after staffing, um, well, I'll read it. Point five, where choices are available, only do business with outside organizations and individuals that have demonstrated commitments, uh, commitment to social justice and anti-racism, including BIPOC owned operated businesses and practices. Um, I think that's important. That's something that I hadn't thought of, uh, which is very important. I don't know how we identify it, but that's our job. We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, Six, uh, thoroughly evaluate the successes and failures of remote education stra educational strategies and techniques that have been used. Develop a specific plan for how to improve these techniques, uh, strategies, sorry, and techniques with specific attention paid to marginalized students, including uh, black, indigenous, and people of color. Um, that's a hard one. Uh, personally, I, I, I don't know where to begin on that, and we have to, um, especially if this lasts longer, if, if our remote situation lasts a lot longer um anyone have any ideas on that um or actually we'll go to we'll go to molly first because we have three people with questions and then we'll see if anyone has any points on those uh molly yeah i just wanted to say i i was um thinking action step wise and early on i think it might have been the second point there was something about devoting a staff meeting it said like um one a year or something and then the stuff you read more recently sounded like more frequent action but i i wanted to just put a plug in for frequent action i think what we devote our staff meetings to indicates what we value um and i feel as a teacher like having a period of time at multiple staff meetings throughout the year is more effective than one big staff meeting once a year. Uh, so I'd like to, you know, I'd like to propose something like sharing time for teachers to discuss things that are happening in their classrooms, um, 
problem solving situations that came up and not you know if people didn't know how to deal with them etc because i think a lot of the a lot of the learning that happens isn't from the curriculum itself it's from what arises in the classroom and how teachers deal with it my internet's pretty wonky right now you guys are freezing oh, are, i don't are, know if you're hearing me fine. yeah okay <laughs> I, I, I think that was point h which says uh, hold ourselves accountable to at least annually taking an organizational inventory of how well we're doing in terms of meeting the above commitments and then taking corrective action as required. Um, uh, definitely at least annually. It should be as frequently as is reasonable for, for each yeah. school. Yeah, I agree. Um, I know you it. have a list of things. I think okay. one of the challenges that we have here is that there's a lot of people that don't know what's been going on in the district over the last few years. Um, and so, um, and also like the the work that I do so is so marginalized that people don't know about what I do. Like for example, like what Henry is saying, I've been hosting a dinner for the staff and a staff of color for the last three years, where I talk to them about their experiences. So that that has been happening. Um, so like there is a pulse. This is not. I mean, it's not rocket science, but also, I mean, I feel like that it might be hard to, to do um, the piece about distance learning, but people are already taking um, stock of what's happening with distance learning. So the idea is, is like, how do we not be in silos and how do we work together? Um, so some, so many of these things like are we are moving towards, which the problem is that we're not walking together. And um, I think the other challenge is, um, you know, what do we have to do to be seen in this work? It's that it's not, I mean, every school could easily have a diversity equity committee. Every school should easily have a diversity equity teacher, teacher leader. It's a stipended position like any other um, teacher leader. So um, those things I feel like are the infrastructure that we need to support the kids and to support the administrators and working towards doing more things that are institutionalized and also really committed to creating a just environment for all our kids. Absolutely. Um, David? Well, I see Zara's iPhone was ahead of me, Thomas, I think. Oh, was it? OK, Zara? I, I think so. Maybe not. Hi. I'm Hello. Zara. How you doing? Um, good, thank you. Um, I'm a parent um, at Dummer Student School, and um, I also work in higher ed in Western Mass. Um, I have a couple of points. Going back to trying to diversify the staff, I think that's really important. Um, based on my experiences in higher ed and trying to diversify faculty and student bodies, I think it's really important to consider like the support that you would um, give to those programs, whether it's an exchange or some kind of, um, what was it called? Uh, um, sorry, I'm forgetting the word. But if you're bringing people in, it, I, th I would suggest thinking about a cohort in a way, a structure of supporting those people um, coming in, especially if they're considered you know, visiting temporarily. Um, because coming to such a predominantly white space can be overwhelming. And um, I know that in higher ed, we, we do have trouble main, um, keeping uh, faculty because did, did, of that. Did you get another step? No, thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, I didn't see any um, Points, I forget which point it was where you were talking about um, groups that support students. I would love to see some kind of parent support um, and education provided addressed because I think it's great to um, address the faculty and the curriculum and supporting students. But if you leave out the parents, that's a huge part of the equation that's not being addressed. And I think it would be helpful to uh, factor that in. I think that's the hardest one. Uh, but yeah, if if the kids don't, if the kids go home to parents who do the opposite, you know, it's gonna it's gonna hurt. 
So that's a great point. I don't know what yeah. we do, but we, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I think what you were referring to was the, um, the residency idea. Um, yes. 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 Thank like you. My wife's idea was yes, not just one person, uh, maybe a couple of people. So they don't, <laughs> if, if they're coming to Vermont, maybe they don't feel so alone. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's the other part of it. Yeah. Um, David, did you have a question? Uh, it, well, actually, uh, more of an observation. The, um, when Daddy spoke about, um, I think, sort of taking your time and, and really being strategic about developing this, it kind of took the air out of my balloon because I was kind of hoping we'd get a motion tonight and bring it to the board next week and just, you know, set a 90-day deadline for action plans and we'd be off. But I think, um, I'm thinking now that, that we're going to, you know, the whole board will, this will be on our agenda on, the, on July 1st, our next meeting. And um, I think because we've we're, we've been talking about this in in parts, it's it's sort of identified the ones that it seems like have to come first. Uh, things like uh, training the staff, and we've talked about. In fact, on our agenda for tonight was to talk more about training for uh, for the board and for administrators, but but for all staff, everybody that works with kids. And um, I think even more important might be creating a space and resources for, for, for teachers, particularly to do the internal work of, of developing that critical consciousness. And then the, the third one, which actually is maybe even more important than those two, is to have the, um, what uh, Zara just mentioned, the, 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 the student focused group, obviously engaging parents as well. Uh, that, is, you know, that is something that we do in our uh, leadership councils uh, in, every, in every school. And it makes sense for them to be engaged in this as well. But for, uh, to, to get the student focus group started in the schools, to get diversity and equity committee started in the schools and a teacher leader in every school, to have the, the, the physical infrastructure of those groupings, those support groups or those work groups or both together, to have space and resources so the teachers can actually do this work in, in a thoughtful and effective, effective way and to provide the, 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 quality, the high quality training that, that Jillian talked about and that Dottie actually administers or um, provides to people. And um, so I, I'm thinking that when we meet next week, uh, we should talk about those, getting those three things underway. I, I think adopt the plan because it's clear that we have str there's strong support in the board and clearly in the community as well to adopt the plan and then try to make headway on those in those three areas. But at any rate, the, the board is going to have to um, sort through that next week. But I think we've, we've gotten some really, really strong and, and excellent ideas from people and, and perspectives. So I'm really very grateful. So personally, David, for me, I think the, the, the hiring and staffing diversity is the biggest emergency um, because it's going to take time to remedy because we can't um, we can't do a lot of, especially with this, with what we're going to be going through financially, we can't do a lot of uh, hiring immediately. So this is going to take time to, uh, to fix. And I think we have to set a, a goal that we will not drop below. Um, we're dismal right now. And I think if we do not set goals that we will not, we will not be underrepresented this poorly. Um, again, if we don't start on that soon, it's, it's, it's just going to, is going to be very difficult. So for me, uh, staffing is the biggest issue. But like you know, these every single issue here is mandatory to me. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, um, it's a long-term project. Zara, or did you not close your not low? Where where is Zara? Oh, there you are. I'm did you here. still have a question? No. Oh, sorry. I uh, I have to take my hand down. I'm sorry. It's okay, Sean. You're muted. Yeah, I, I, uh, I really concur with what you just said, Thomas. And I, that's what I meant when I said it should be simplified in some way. So right, in other words, take the eight items and perhaps prioritize them um, for a timeline sequence and also uh, achievability. Um, and I had said earlier that it was difficult. And I think I go back to Timothy's. Um, he also mentioned that some things are difficult. It's hard to uh, to achieve some of these things just because of the demographics. Um, so 
it, it's not a simple process, but it's definitely one that needs to be done. And then if I could, I, I would go back when I um, really read over this uh, piece of paper and I always get my highlighter out and get my dictionary out and I look at uh, word choice. And actually I was a little slowed down by the word, the use of the word anti-racist. And I looked up racism and uh, racist is a noun of the word racism. So if you say anti-person, I was wondering whether there wouldn't be a more inclusive um, word to use in that instance, um, like inclusive. Um, I, I don't know whether that has any credibility for anybody else, but it, it, does, uh, it does bother me a little bit. And I did find uh, online that some people had said that the word anti-racist is, uh, you know, has a quite a negative connotation. I mean, um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know. I'd just be curious if anybody has any ideas similar. So my interpretation between the difference between anti-racist and not racist is anti-racism is working against it, like um, a concert, making a concerted effort against racist instead of not personally being racist. That was, maybe I'm wrong, that was my interpretation. Um, but yes, that's a very good point. Let's make sure we know what the words mean that we're adopting. You can ask uh, Jillian, Dottie, or uh, Michaela might have a, a comment on that as well. We have lots of questions. If you don't mind, Sean, I'm going to go, or, or if anybody else wanted to immediately make a point. But we have a... I mean, I the only point that I can make is like this, um, for me, is... Oh, my, my thing is frozen again. Sorry. Um, it's really challenging. I could say that like... That of course that I agree with you, um, Thomas. That anti-racist, uh, it's not my favorite word, but I feel like it's the most direct and clear word that people are using right now um, to describe the the direction that we're going in. And so the idea is that all of us we live in a race, racist society, and so we have racist ideas because we can't not have racist ideas. But the idea of the word anti-racist is that you're going to work against those ideas in your head, but not only stop there, but also work against the institutionalized racism that and systemic racism that's in our society. And so um, that's how I see that word. And I, I feel like that's how it's used. And um, Sean, we didn't get a chance to talk today, but I, there are books that I can give you to look at. Um, but also, I feel like I feel really, really challenged by this idea that our problem is that people of color don't want to move here. There are a lot of people of color here. Um, there are a lot of people here that have been turned off to our schools. There are people currently leaving our schools. So, and and my first question is how we have asked them to stay, which I asked in the board meeting in the open board meeting, and it was kind of like um, I think Dave said, oh, "Well, that's all our jobs." But so like, I feel like. Some of this conversation is frustrating for that reason um that there's a whole list of why people of color stay and sometimes it's a bet against our better judgment to stay in these positions but um this meeting i find like beyond frustrating like that we need a cohort that we're so special is actually like how about we look at who applies for these jobs and i've been in positions when i know the people of color have to apply for the job but it just hasn't been important enough to hire a person of color. So this idea that we're not getting them, I feel like now is somewhat true because we're just getting so few applicants for a lot of jobs. But also what's true is that it's not a priority. So yes, is it great? Should we offer money, people money to move? Should we do all these other things? Should we have cohorts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually there are things that can happen now that people are not doing because there is not a commitment to do this work. And so that is what's really frustrating to me is that like somehow the thought is that um, there are people of color around here. There are plenty. There's a person of color here who applied for be an administrator that didn't even get an interview. So like this, that, that, this idea that we have to create some huge new thing is, not, is false. 
And that is right now, that, that's why this level of conversation is really frustrating to me. We need a commitment. We don't need a whole bunch of rigmarole and different programs. And we don't have it. And I, I think that this, kind, this, this level is like, it makes it so hard for me to do my job. Can you, exp can you expand on that? How does it make you hard, hard for you to do your job? Can you, do you, do you feel like there's too much bureaucracy getting in the way? I feel like sometimes there's a lack of clear vision. Uh, and, and just a lack of prioritizing these kind of things. And that's, equity in the schools and that, I mean, people will say, like no person is gonna say that equity is not important. Of course, everyone's gonna say equity is important, but their actions don't say that. Right. Just their words do. And so, um, I mean, I kid you not, like I got a call from a guy last year and he called me again this year, like, should I apply for this job? You know, like, what should I do? And I just passed on his resume, but I don't think he got an interview. You know what I mean? Like, this is a man of color. so. And so this, so who wanted an administrative job and he, I, he didn't get an interview a year ago and I don't think he got an interview this time. So, I mean, I, um, so I'll, I don't know where to start. <laughs> well, all I can tell you is one, only one of the 10 board members I'm a hundred percent behind it, and my my feeling is everyone else's as well. And we're gonna we're we're making a, a concerted effort right now, and we will do it. Yeah, and I feel like the other piece is is that I think the training is really important, but that's just a beginning. That's just an entry point. All these people need to be in study groups. They need to be reading. They need to be talking. They need to be questioning themselves and each other, and that doesn't happen. Everyone wants to talk about what to do with the kids. They don't want to talk about how what to do with themselves. Well, if you don't mind, we have a lot of questions. Uh, Sean, are you done? I'm done. Michaela, too. <laughs> Sean's hand is still up. You done, Sean? I, no, I'm sorry. I'll take it down. All right. Mine, and, mine is frozen. My computer's frozen. I can't do anything. You can just speak. It's all right. Anne? I would, yeah, I would like to echo Michaela's sentiments because none of this is new. There have been efforts made to hire more diversely, but every, evidently the resumes don't get looked at. Um, I've been sitting with this committee for four years with the uh, Teachers Diversity and Equity Committee and they've done such incredible work, which is why I think that it is appreciably more important that we make this commitment regardless of how we're going to do it, whether we've figured it out yet or not. I want us to make the commitment to do this. Well, this keeps coming up. This is the point, the main point of the meeting. Um, as a as a point of procedure, I don't know if the the board members have to vote to uh, bring this up to the meeting and recommend it. But as the chair, I would I want to say that I recommend it. It seems to be the uh, uh, unanimous uh, thought of everyone here. But let's all go on record. I wholeheartedly support recommending this to the board, and on the board, I will vote to uh, to adopt it. Anybody else? I make that commitment as well. You can just unmute yourself if you're on the I'm, board, especially. I'm with you. I'm with you. David, we can't hear you. I'm spoiled by being the host. I never have to unmute myself when I'm chairing the meeting. <laughs> so now I'm just like everybody else and forget it all the time. The, um, I, I support that as well. I actually, I think that in terms of uh, process, if we came up with a, um, and actually I've got a draft here that we might want to work a little bit on, the board's going to have a, a robust conversation. So whatever we say to the board, they're going to you know, take that 
to heart, but the conversation is going to go wherever it goes, just like this one did. And um, but I think if we if we say that we endorse we, that we recommend that the board endorse the uh, the post commitment doc document and under, undertake developing a st strategic plan to implement it in 90 days so that what you know not saying it has to be 90 but saying we want it done and we want it done in a reasonable in a reasonable amount of time and that the idea is to address uh, to come up with a strategic plan and i think sean said i'm going to get find his words here uh, a timeline a sequence and 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 what's achievable to have those be the components of the well i'm getting i'm getting too wordy now but basically to say we endorse this we want uh, we want to uh, we want a strategic plan to address all of these points in all of the schools uh, within 90 days, and 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 then we want to start undertaking the implementation process. And I think if we brought a, a motion like that to the board, that would really focus the conversation and make it really clear that that um, I think there are four board. Well, Liz is here too, although not a member of this exact committee. But we have four board five board members here. So um, actually, if we have five board maybe we can't vote on it because uh actually only the committee members uh should would vote on it only the four of us just to be safe with okay the, so, so shall with, we? This, with the open meeting laws yeah so i move that we uh, as a committee uh recommend this to the full board for adoption Do I have I a second? man thank you so between uh I forget, Tim, are you on this committee? No, I'm not. Okay, so me, David, Sean, and Ann. Mm -hmm. Yes. Jackie. But Jackie's not here today. Oh, yeah, she's not here today. So uh, unmute and raise your hand if you, uh, re if you uh, recommend this motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> yeah. So it's, so it's moved and we'll recommend it to the board at the seven, uh, the July 1st meeting for adoption and as David correctly put, um, within 90 days to have have it implemented in a reasonable time frame. Okay. Um, let's Thomas, if I may, can you also make sure that there is a in the way you put that forward that that there is a time frame for looking at whether that has happened. To, sorry, to, to look at to what look has at, happened. To actually review if it has happened or not. That that's what I think is meant by 90 days. That we will, we will revisit it in 90 days to see what has been done. Okay, perfect. And that'll you. be part of what the board, um, what, what I assume the board will do is we will have specific deadlines that we will need the administration and uh, everyone to report back to us with progress. Thank you. Thank you. We have lots of comments. Uh, Robin. Uh, I just wanted to briefly comment on something that Tara and Zara had both touched on and David even about the leadership councils and about involving um, parents in having input into this work. That I really hope that even though this isn't in the document specifically, that the board could direct schools to make a goal and a whatever kind of accountability that's needed for that about making sure that there are diverse voices on the leadership councils and the other parent groups too like the the um ptos because right now i don't know about all the other okay i'll help you i'll help you i don't know about all of the other schools but the one that i'm on is very homogeneous um as far as race and i think that is we don't have diverse very diverse staffs yet but we do have diverse communities that is one road in to get input into what we're doing in our schools very good point we better not have a bunch of um, leadership councils and groups that are part of the problem so yeah let's we that'll be part of the uh well, thomas do we want to um make a, a motion or a recommendation um to that effect too how shall we word it? Can you think of a good way? Um, well, I, I mentioned it at the last meeting, and I think it, I don't remember exactly what I said, but that 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 um, that they all that they should all make a really a really concerted effort to identify and, and welcome um, 
a more diverse uh, membership from the community. I think the what um, what you mentioned and uh, somebody else mentioned is you know two people or more. I mean, get, inviting more than one person and making it welcoming and and uh, making them you know know that there's going to be some value and that they're going to be included is is really important. And um, so it's I mean this is another. I guess maybe what we should do is instead of maybe a motion to distribute, just have a an agenda on the an agenda item that um, just uh, diversity on leadership, diverse or inclusion on leadership councils, and we'll just talk about it together. Are you referring specifically to the to the school um, leadership councils? Not yes. Not the, okay. Yeah, the leadership. Yeah. I, I think I think we should add that in the the, the whole board meeting. I think that would make yeah. Them a yeah, I'll, I'll make sure I'll get it on the agenda, I and we'll talk about it the first. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Robin, if you're done, we have Tim. Um, okay. We're two hours away from the Mecca of higher education that graduates hundreds and hundreds of new teachers every year. There's UMass, there's Harvard Graduate School of Education, there's Boston University. These folks are looking for jobs right now. I know from experience that it's, they just graduated and they're still looking for jobs. Um, Part of this whole plan, if we're going to be successful, is to really um, go to Boston and uh, and actively, proactively recruit these people. Get on the uh, on the name list of the um, offices that uh, that place people. Secondly, it's a vast resource for consultants. Um, we're, we're talking about fully agree that we need training for staff, teachers, um, and parents too. And there's some excellent work being done two hours away from us. So I, I'm just encouraging the uh, committee to consider Boston, Cambridge, the vast resources of, uh, of talent there to bring here temporarily and to attract them, to proactively go out there and say, we want you. Well, Michaela, I don't know if you want to speak to that your your plan that you had that was a little bit thwarted by what the by the pandemic by not being able to do much in person. But um, maybe in case everyone doesn't know about the idea you had for different uh, school fairs, uh, university uh, fairs, and, and meeting people in person. Yeah, well, one of them um, was to combine college visits with um, going to university job fairs, so taking young people with me. Um, to visit college exit colleges, especially historically black colleges. We've always tried to go with Dottie, but it never has never worked out to go with Dottie and her students. Um, but um, and so that would serve a double purpose. Also, the, the students that I work with at the school also, also offer workshops to adults. So they've held workshops um, at teacher education conferences and also here at the public library. And so just as a way to showcase, like this is the equity work that we're doing in our schools. And it's not just coming from adults, it's also coming from the kids and they're able to um, create the community that they wanna see. And that work is happening in our district. Um, so yeah. it kind of, it, it served multiple purposes. Um, and yeah, that was supposed to happen this March and April, but yeah. All the field trips got canceled. Then we'll figure out another way, at least remotely, because it's a great idea. It's, I think, probably the way we'll have the most success. Uh, Jillian? Hi, sorry. Um, I, I'm blanking on who brought it up before. I think it was Robin. I also uh, want to emphasize point of yes having like elevating and prioritizing BIPOC um, in being in these spaces of either being the ones doing the training being the committee members or being the teachers teacher leaders who are identified that is incredibly important this uh, I know that you already made a motion to present this and support this I personally do think that some more changes should be made within it just to emphasize these points um before bringing it to to uh the larger group so that may be something that you want to make some motions on later to include it within this another thing a point that i was considering 
I hear you. I've heard various people say that, you know, you wanted to figure out what to prioritize most. I think logistically that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot on here. You have to figure out how to implement it all to the best of your abilities. Um, and sometimes that does mean certain things need to be prioritized a bit over the others at different times. But I do want to say that all of these are very important. This addressing racial justice and trying to uh, make your education system one where it is anti-racist, all of these are elements of it. They're elements that are long overdue. They're elements that have been ignored for a long time or ones that have people have made attempts to correct this and there hasn't been the support around that. Um, but all of it combines together. And I kind of want to caution people to be a little, you know, be a little wary of what, of prioritizing what and why. Um, if you do prioritize something, don't prioritize it for like the entire year. I, I personally, this is my suggestion. I think all of these are really important elements and they do need to be addressed. And a third thing, the point where it says the, let's see, which one is it? The second to last one that says ensure that each school has one, a student focused organization where BIPOC students can provide each other with support and collectively define issues needing additional attention or focus. And then it was to the diversity and equity committee, which includes responsibility for leading regular discussions about white supremacy at staff meetings and three um, diversity and equity teeter, teacher leaderships identified. I would also like to see a little more um, fleshed out in this particular area. Um, I know that the entire, this entire document, the entire proposal, all of these are to help benefit the students the most. And I do think everything on here is incredibly important. And yet this is the only one that I'm seeing that really provides space for the students to be involved in this sort of action or where it's creating space specifically for them. Um, this may have already been a goal, but because I don't see it spelled out here, I'm not entirely sure if are students working directly with this diversity and equity committee? Will there be will there be a student representative on this committee? Um, how do we make sure that students feel that they're not just providing a support system for themselves, but that they have people who they can turn to uh, when they need support um, from from a a person in a in a position that can do that aside from being their peers. I, part of that is also like, I know um, these are great, all of this is great. That's not gonna, it's not gonna necessarily erase the fact that there are, there are racist people within this education system in Vermont. Um, not all of them are gonna be easily identified, but I do know that they are in place. And like, I, I actually, my high school was outside of this district, it was in Rockingham. Um, but I know that the high school librarian has been recently um, commenting pretty racist rhetoric on social media. She's been doing it to, I think because of certain rules and regulations, like she's not, she isn't, I don't believe friends, Facebook friends with any of her, the current students at the school, but she is friends with those who have graduated. And that information is still like she, she's putting it out there very openly. Some of the students, some of her former students can also have siblings who are still within uh, the, the school district that she's teaching in or a member of. And information is, is put out there. But if, if students are become aware of this or just from firsthand experience, maybe maybe their professor, their teacher hasn't said anything, but the student, the child of a, of a teacher, because oftentimes we do have teachers who have children um, going to school within the same district the children may be speaking uh, racist rhetoric or making remarks there. And it's not necessarily always fair to blame that on the parents, the parental figures, but it's likely that they got influenced in that way some, somehow. And I'm just gonna say as somebody who was, like my school was full of a lot of racist people and I knew that there were racist teachers there as well. And it, it was incredibly devastating to feel as if there wasn't anywhere I could turn to, to actually seek support in that or even vocalize it. Um, and I think we need to make sure that there is that space for students and that there is that support for them. And that it's not just, okay, students, we're doing all of this external work to try and help, 
but like how do we incorporate your voices how do we make sure that you are being elevated and you are being heard so i would love to see um, a little more emphasis on that within this particular point and yeah i i personally think it needs to be really written in before this is sent to each district. i just I, we need to have that that's all thank you well what i would recommend um, to you, um, sorry I just wanted to, to, to respond really quickly, if I could, sure. just to, to ask Julian to please, I mean, I saw you writing furiously, and I'm, I'm recording this, but if you could jot down some, some of those ideas, Julian, and, and, and send them to me, but more importantly, if you can join us next, next July 1st for the meeting at 6 o'clock and share that, because these are the voices that we need in the conversation. You know things and understand things that we don't. And um, so if, if you can are, are willing to participate a little bit longer, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I would uh, love to attend as long as I'm available. I will try and make sure that that's free time on my schedule. Great. So. If, I, if I can get your email, I'll make sure you get the agenda and the link. But it's, also, uh, it's, it's always on the website. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Exactly my recommendation is please come to the board meeting. Um, we hear it, the ones who are happen, happen to be here, but when we bring this up on uh, July 1st, these are the things we'll discuss. Um, so if you can be there, there's a public discussion of any motion. When we have the motion to adopt this, we have public discussion and things like this are perfect. So if you can't attend, like, like David said, please at least email him and we'll have the communication. Okay, we have many other people. Mary? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I came on to the call late. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I came on late, so I, I just want to apologize quickly in advance if I'm repeating some of what has said, because some of my comrades are here who may have spoken this. Um, so some folks, some of you might know me. Um, you know, I've done a bit of work in the school district over the years, worked with Michaela. Um, Dottie and I have done some work together with the school board. And so I've been in the district for a long time. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out to uh, Michaela's and Dottie's comments. Um, and again, I think it's been said, but this work has been happening out of Michaela's office and and when before Michaela Janicki's office um, for a long time and, and I think what's been chronically um, a problem is not enough support and I'm not just talking about financial support I'm talking about sort of moral support um, support by leadership and I do this kind of work across the state with several folks who are on this call and what is really glaringly apparent to me in all the places where I've worked is that if there is not 100% investment by school leadership, administration particularly, um, then it's really difficult for folks who are faculty or staff to keep this momentum going. And, and again, I think Michaela does what she can do and has done a brilliant job of that for so many years. And in some ways that work has been invisible. And again, these are my observations, but this work has been invisible because I don't see leadership there who is trying to bring that work to the forefront. And that's a, something that really needs to shift if this is going to happen. You know, you're asking people in many ways to shift their worldview. We're talking about a paradigm shift here. It's not just piecemealing this activity, this student group, this training um, together. And I'm, as, as somebody who does facilitation and training, I'm, I'm guilty to the extent of having been almost colluding with the training, thinking that that was the end all be all. And it's clearly not, you know, it needs to be a framework, which I think this proposal is trying to get at, which addresses um, a paradigm shift. And also as Dottie mentioned, which I think is super important is you need strategic points for each of the goals or objectives. And the other piece I haven't heard is what we're talking about, maybe Robin, you alluded to this, this is about disrupting white supremacy culture. So we're not just talking about, you know, um, a teacher or, or a curriculum or um, a particular school that has like more racial harassment. We're talking about a cultural shift in the school district. And as I've watched it for several years, I feel like I see it inch by inch and then we take a few steps back. And so, if we aren't looking at this as a full framework shift, as a, as a shift of culture and understanding that structural racism and structural oppression, sorry about the dog barking, um, 
exist within educational systems, then I, I, I want to say to folks, the work isn't going to shift because you've got to look at it from all these different angles that have been named already today, which is hiring, recruitment and retention. We've had folks of color in the school district. And, it was, and I have said to folks along the way, have exit interviews happen so we can understand why people aren't staying here. So we also, if I remember correctly, we have 20 to 22% children of color in the district. Like folks are here. But I think it's interesting when us white folks are saying, well, we don't see those people or we're not really, it's like there's a, an invisibility sometimes that I think we need to, to, to really pay attention to, which I think is white supremacy culture. So there's no easy fixes to this, but if we don't have full commitment, I'm delighted the board is entertaining this, but if leadership principals, vice principals, if those folks are not on board, then this isn't gonna go anywhere. Michaela and Ken Williams and I did a training, I don't know what it was, Michaela, eight or 10 years ago, talking about recruitment and retention. So this is not a new conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And, and like we just said uh, to Jillian, please everyone involved here, if you're interested, please come to the board meeting because that's when even more will be decided. So we wanna hear these voices in front of everybody. Um, uh, Ron, uh, Rhonda? I'm okay. Thank oh, you. Okay. Uh, Ellen? Hi. Um, I just wanted to, um, I, I loved what Mary just said. It, it's not just about financial support, but it also is also about financial support. And I'm curious if this, this, um, this framework that we're offering, does it include any kind of financial support to help with all the things that we're trying to do? Because I know Michaela is doing, you know, 150% now. So, you know, what, is, is there a financial piece or a budget that will cover some of these trainings and some of the, these groups? And um, that's my question. There will have to be, yeah. And that's what the board will have to figure out. But yes, this isn't for free. So. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. That's what budgets are for, to be spent, so. Yeah, Sean? Yeah, I was just wondering um, two things. One is, um, should this uh, commitment be a policy of the district? Um, I mean, that's a possibility. Um, as opposed to a commitment, which is uh, doesn't have the formal structure of a policy. Uh, that was one thing. And then the other thing is um, a lot of people referred to the leadership councils. And I think there's a dichotomy because there's the school leadership councils and then there's the staff leadership councils. And I think it would be really important to identify them as such each time somehow. Um, and in light of that, I think the leadership councils at the schools w could be um, really, really helpful in moving this commitment forward. As also um, has been mentioned, I think it's really important to make sure that the administration is also on board with this commitment or policy, either one. Um, so anyway, that's it. Thanks. And that's a very good question. I hadn't thought about that. When when the board adopts this, uh, it probably would be more effective if it was a specific policy. So we'll discuss we'll discuss that. Yeah, uh, Michael. You're I just wanted to uh, I just wanted to uh, remind everybody that our intent, the intent of the uh, diversity and equity committee. Uh, for the district was, I think the word that Ellen used, which I like, was to provide a framework, a framework for what we're trying to do. How we do it, and an example would be, how do we involve kids, how do we involve students in this, is really getting down to the next level of detail, I think, that needs to be worked out again at, for each of the school, at the school's level. And that will vary by school of how that's done and where kids, where students get involved. 
Um, so I, again, this is intended to be a framework, not intended to be the details of how to. And I think that a lot of um, what the, the purpose of this committee is going to be afterwards, assuming the board adopts this, is how we implement it, the specifics. Um, that's probably going to be left to this board to bring, uh, this committee to bring to the board. Yeah. Uh, if you're okay, we'll go to Jillian. Hi, thank you. I'm actually, yeah, I'm about to leave, but I did just want to say, um, that I understand that there's going to be a lot of specifics to all of this that are going to be needed to be sorted out by each school individually. However, I think when you're making this sort of commitment that you're calling on each school to adhere to, um, it does not hurt in any way to have a, a little more specifics in there about how student inclusion should be also prioritized. It's not giving all the details, but it's it's noting that this is important to you and that you believe it should be important to each school. I think that might be a little bit uh, covered in um, section seven where we talk about having a student focused organization. As so well. that's what I was that's what I was saying. I don't believe like I see that you have space for a student focused organization um, and where the students but the fact that you say it's like where students can provide each other with support and collective find issues needing additional attention to focus there's not there's not something specified in there that says um the diversity and equity committee or the diversity and equity teacher leaders are going to also be like direct supports for the students that the students can communicate and collaborate with them as well and that's like the committee you know there should honestly there should just be a student rep there should be space for that maybe that's something that you feel is too specific that each school will have to decide and determine but i just do think there needs to be a little more clarity on um the type of role that students will have or the type of supports that they will have in this because right there it puts it a little to me reading it reading it here it looks more as if like, yes, we're creating space for students to talk and support each other, but there's less of like that connection between them and the faculty or staff or anyone else involved. Personally, I think student reps on this committee would be great. I think that's- Yeah, and the, I do too. I personally, I think that should be a standard across the board. Yeah. Um, it's the sort of thing I, I also am speaking not only as a former student of Vermont, but like I just recently graduated um, from Smith College and I served for three years on the student Senate. And I know that I also was the I was the um, vice president of my class. It was a class for non traditionally students. And we always every time we had committees, we had to make sure that there were representatives of the people that we were claiming to be supporting and representing. Like we needed them in there with us. Uh, it's very important to have that sort of space. And so personally, I think that should just be written in period. I know that other people might not fully understand that or agree, but if that isn't particularly written in, then I think there still needs to be a little more emphasis on the types of that this would have in place. Absolutely. Sean, did you still have a question? Oh, no, I'm sorry. So the next point on our agenda after this was to talk about board and administrative implicit bias training and options and goals, but I think that's gonna be covered with this. Um, I, th I think um, when we have, which note was it? I think it was, I'm sorry. Yeah, number two, training the staff. I think we would include the board and administration in that as well. I think, I think this pretty much covers that. Does anyone else anyone else have any other things to add to this? And I, like I said, please come to the board meeting if you're interested. Are we good? Well, we'll have a big board meeting on the first. And we did some, uh, I'm glad we got this done. All right. If you have any other, I, I'll, I'll say if we're going to add the, if we're going to end this now, if you have any other thoughts and you can't make the board meeting, please at least send it to, to David or to all of the board for us to uh, have the communication because we read them. Um, okay. I'll make a motion uh, to, to adjourn if we're all set.
Good? Thank you. All right. See you all soon. Thank you. Nice work, Thomas. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.